Afternoon, Live Oak friends. How's everybody? Good today? Man, it's so good to be here. It's always a privilege and a pleasure for me to come and spend some time with you guys. This is our third installment of these quarterly Faith Development Lunch and Learns, and uh, it really just blows me away that you guys continue to come. And I think it speaks to a bigger picture of what God is doing in this city and beyond. And that's kind of why I want to kick off today. Um, you know, it's really important for you guys to understand this is simply a conversation about faith outside of the walls of church. It's not a real conversation about real faith and like what it really looks like between Sundays, you know? I think a lot of times we get in this trap of feeling like there's these walls between faith and business and how do we navigate this and we don't know how to step into it. And so we have the opportunity to have that conversation here and then tie it into not only how it supports but how it strengthens the philanthropic efforts of the bank here in this city and beyond. And as I got to thinking about this today, you know, the fact that we're here doing this it is miraculous to me. Like it really is kind of crazy that we're even here. And I wanted to give you guys a little bit of a backstory, especially those who haven't been with us before, to, to really understand like how wild it is that we're actually doing these here. So about a year and a half ago, um, my, my business partner and good friend Kevin Adams, who is, uh, is with us today, uh, we had this idea uh, and, and an opportunity to start a radio show. Now what you need to know about this is this is not something that we sought out. This wasn't us knocking on doors and saying, hey, can we have a radio show? Someone came to us, provided us the forum to have a radio show. Never been on the radio before, mind you. Would you guys like to have a radio show? And so we said, sure, let's jump into this. And, and we joked, this was kind of humble beginnings, small AM radio station here in Wilmington, North Carolina, having a conversation about faith. Ceiling tiles are falling in. The toilet doesn't work. Uh, there are times when the microphones don't work, you know, and we're in this little glass room about the size of this table here, and we've got people like staring in the windows. Like it was incredibly hard to focus and have this radio show, and we joked that like eight people listened, and one of them was Kevin's wife, Holly, my wife, Liz, my mom, and then some mixture of like our children. Between us, there's a few, and, and, and yet there was one person that listened, and that's J.P. Blevins. And JP reached out to us and he said, guys, I want y'all to come to the bank. I want to talk to you about this radio show. And so Kevin and I, you know, we get in the car, we drive up to here to Live Oak and we're just like, oh, wow, I'm going to the, you know, the Grove and we're sitting down and JP goes, guys, I got to tell you, what you guys are talking about on this show, it's powerful. And there's never been a time in our culture where it's more needed than right now. And Kevin and I are like, yeah, you know, wow, but yes, like this is our heart, you know. And, and, and so we started to step in. Now, the curious thing is the radio show was canceled last August. And so we're like, God, what are you doing? You know, we have this radio show. We're getting great feedback. Like, what are you doing? And so Kevin and I, through prayer and just going before the Lord, God said, I want you to build this organization. And so we joined together to form Uprint. And that is our faith development organization. And the heart of Uprint is to help people uncover their why, thrive in their gifts, and live the life of impact that they were created for. And so we put together this infrastructure, this incredible mentoring program and coaching program, one-to-one, -to, -one, to understand how people can le learn to unpack their why and step into this. And we created these, these courses. And, and so God has been doing this thing, right? And then all of a sudden in December, we meet with JP and say, what would it look like to have a conversation at the bank? And he introduced us to Kate and said, we've actually got this vision for this philanthropic effort. And, and, and we said, great, we can come in and try this and see what happens. And guys, the response has been overwhelming. But I want to tell you guys, it's more than what happens in this room. God is doing some crazy, incredible, cool things in this city through you guys. Through this bank, God is using you to make an incredible and profound impact on the city and beyond. And you see, as I thought about it, as I was preparing for today, the heart of Uprint, our organization, and the heart of Live Oak, it's the same heart. We have a vision for this city. We want to make a difference. We want to have an impact beyond kind of the four walls and see how God might use that for something bigger than ourselves. And, and so there's three specific things that I wanted to share with you guys that y'all are a part of that God is really kind of uh, starting to open up with us at Uprint, and we believe that He's opening up for you guys here at Live Oak as well. 
So after our second quarter luncheon, when I had the, the privilege of interviewing Jimmy Mahan, we were connected with the guys at 106.7 FM, Wilmington's Big Talker. And they have since offered us a radio show. So you print and wake up our faith is back live on the air on Sundays for a conversation, as we call it, to look at the upside of upside down living. And that's just incredible that we have this opportunity to take this conversation that happens in the Oak Room and to move it into the city streets of Wilmington and beyond. So if you guys have your devices or something to write with, I want to share this with you guys because every Sunday at 1 p.m. we are on the air on 106.7 FM. And the cool thing is, is with technology the way it is today, we actually get to put this to our podcast. So we have a podcast called Wake Up Our Faith. Any podcast app, you know, the iTunes app, so forth, Wake Up Our Faith, you can grab the podcast. And I share that with you guys because I want to encourage you. If you're wondering, how could I take the conversations that happen inside the Oak Room during these luncheons, how could we take that conversation beyond that is a great way that you guys can do it. Point folks to the podcast. You guys can listen. Uh, we also need support for the radio show. Uh, we have our first two corporate sponsors that are on board. Uh, we're constantly looking for folks to jump in with that as well. Uh, but I wanted to let you guys know about that because it's something really cool that God's opened up uh, that we would like to ask you guys to pray for and be a part of. Secondly, we felt uh, that God was calling us to create these courses, right? these resources that would provide people a fresh perspective of faith because it's great to come into a room and be inspired and even be encouraged. But what does it look like when you leave, right? I mean, that's kind of the eternal struggle, you know, uh, something to kind of walk alongside you. And so we have put together um, kind of a Uprint model, which is our course and teaching materials. And this is actually how we function as an organization. And Kevin does not like this stuff, but my business partner, Kevin Adams, is one of the most profound Christian voices in our culture today. This guy's published by Zondervan, the largest Christian publisher in the world. And he wouldn't stand up here and say it, but guys, I'm telling you, God's hand is on this man. So much so that when Kevin's book, The Extravagant Fool, was running through Zondervan, Lee Strobel's editor said, I want to edit this book. Now, Lee Strobel, if you know, wrote The Case for Christ, The Case for Faith, some of the most impactful kind of Christian literature in the, in the last few decades. Lee Strobel's editor said, I want to work with Kevin on this project because I believe he's a voice for this generation. And so Kevin is, is standing here and he is putting his heart and his soul, taking his testimony, what he's learned by faith, and writing it out in these courses to provide a great, fresh perspective for people. So, we just announced a brand new course called the 21 Day Spiritual Cleanse. See that green smoothie right there? It's kind of like that for your soul, right? It's kind of like that for your spirit. It's goodness, you know? It's good ingredients. It has a start and a finish. And so if you guys uh, are interested in this, I wanted to share the link so you guys could check it out. It's uprint.life. That's our website. Y-O-U-P-R-I-N-T. Dot L I F E, you print dot life forward slash spiritual cleanse. If you go to that link, you'll see the ability to kind of jump into it, and I would encourage you guys to, to check it out. Here's the deal we have a vision for 21,000 people to go through the spiritual cleanse. 21,000. 21,000 people to go through this 21-day spiritual cleanse. Because what the cleanse does is it helps people kind of break free of a lot of the kind of habits they maybe don't even realize and step into their why. So I wanted to share that with you guys. And then finally, I wanted to share the third thing that God's doing. We, as in Uprint, um, are having our first live event outside of Live Oak. And guys, this is an incredible thing. You have to understand, we stepped in faith to say, can we have this conversation at the bank? And here we have, and the feedback has been phenomenal. And so we have partnered with the Bridge Church off of Market Street, and we're having our first event called Crazy for the City. It's going to be August 30th at 6 p.m. at the Bridge Church. And it is a, a gathering for spiritual awakening in southeastern North Carolina and beyond. And, and here's what we're going to share at that event. God has laid a vision on our heart to build a life center in Wilmington, North Carolina. A, a, a building, a physical church between Sundays 
that will be a place where God's work can be done, a kingdom place. And it'll be unlike anything that we've ever seen. And it is a giant vision, but it's a God-sized vision. So he's going to have to do it, which takes all the pressure off and makes it wonderful. We just get to step into it. But I share all of that because I want to tell you guys, this is not about what God's doing at Uprint, what God, this is about a bigger picture. It's about a bigger God who is more real than we can imagine, and he is using us to facilitate his will to be done here in this city and beyond. This is bigger than Live Oak Bank. It's bigger than Wall Street. It's bigger than the NASDAQ and all that good stuff. That stuff's fantastic. But it's the kingdom of God and the work that he wants us to do. Because at the end of the day, we're all going to have a tombstone. And that tombstone is going to have something written on it. And in the very first meeting, I said, guys, do you want someone to stand on stage and give your eulogy and say that you lived an effective life or a faithful one? And our call is one to join with you guys and, and live by faith. Now, you might say, Matt, you got, you're kind of bold to stand up and say, like, God's doing this at Uprint. I mean, God's doing this at, uh, at Live Oak. Like, where does that come from? I got to tell you guys a quick story, and I'm going to read a passage that, uh, that God really laid on my heart this week when I was kind of preparing for this talk. So in, in January of 2015, I had just published my book, Redefine Rich. And I was thinking, like, you know, I'm going to go be a speaker, and, and that was just going to be what I did. And God said, no, breaks. I've got something else for you. Doesn't look like anything that you thought it was going to look like, but this is what I want you to do. And I kept opening my Bible to Isaiah 61. Every day, y'all. I mean, and it wasn't because I had the marker there. You know, I know what you're saying. But it was every day I'd open my Bible, Isaiah 61, boom. Isaiah 61, boom. Isaiah 61, boom. I'm like, hey, what are you trying to say? What's going on here? I want to read this passage to you guys. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty for the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort those who mourn, to grant those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit. And this is the best part. That. Anytime you see that in here, pay attention. That they may be called oaks of righteousness. A planting of the Lord that he may be glorified. They shall build up the ancient ruins, they shall raise up the former devastations, and they shall repair the ruined cities. In my journal, January of 2015, I drew a picture of an oak tree. And I felt like God was saying, I want you to seek out an organization to establish an organization that inspires, encourages, and teaches people Isaiah 61, to proclaim beauty instead of ashes, to comfort those who mourn, to bind up the brokenhearted. And I'm like, I got no clue. But I got an oak tree drawn on a paper in my journal in 2015. And here's the crazy thing. It's 2017, two and a half years later. Where am I standing? In the oak room at Live Oak Bank. Guys, our God is bigger than we can imagine. And He is using this bank, Live Oak Bank, to be an oak of righteousness in this city. You guys know that the bank has contributed, uh, or at least uh, committed to a million dollars of resources for philanthropic causes in this city and beyond. And we believe along with you guys, that's just the beginning. God wants to use the resources that you have, the resources that we have to make an impact in this city that for generations people will look back and say, God did that. That's powerful. That outlives each one of us and points directly to Him. And that is good. That is good. So, so today we're going to hear from Tom Morris, who is a, a good friend of mine. And, and I want to set this up with, with kind of a, a, an idea. 
I dare say right now that there are too few brave people in this world. There are too few brave people in this world. And the world that we live in calls bravery something that it isn't. I think the world calls bravery like these daring acts or, oh my gosh, this guy jumped off this cliff with a squirrel suit on or something. Like, he's brave. Like, that's just crazy. I mean, you might call it bravery, but bravery looks a lot different when you look at it through the lens of the, of the gospel. You know what the bravest thing you can do is? The bravest thing you can do is become who God created you to be. The bravest thing you can do is become who God created you to be. And do you know why? Because the world says that's foolish. The world looks at that and says, that's crazy. But you have to step into who God is calling you to be. That's what bravery is. And that is what we call courageous patience. Isn't it interesting that courage kind of, you know, is this, I'm going to grab my sword and go. But patience is kind of like sitting in a chair. God's story is one of courageous patience. It's continuing to go while trusting that He will provide. He will deliver. And and just to kind of highlight this idea, I I love the story of Moses. I don't know if anybody's touched up on uh, Exodus lately, but the story of Moses is a profound story about identity and about someone who was brave enough to step into exactly what God called him to do. Moses was, was, was this Hebrew man who, who was uh, kind of adopted into the Egyptian household of Pharaoh. And, and if, you know, fast forward, he's out in the desert of Midian and he's, you know, God comes to him in a burning bush and says, Moses, go. And Moses says, I can't. I can't speak well. I'm incapable. And God says, I am. And if you know the story, Moses is called by God to go to Pharaoh. Not one time, but ten times. And finally, Pharaoh lets God's people go. And here's the part of the story I want to focus on. Moses is leading a million people through the desert. They're being delivered from captivity, and they get in the middle of the desert. And if you know the story, they come to the edge of the Red Sea, this moment of impasse. What is going to happen now? And the entire Israelite nation saying, Moses, you're crazy. You have led us out into the desert to die. And their faith is failing. And Moses says something then, guys, that exemplifies what bravery is and what we collectively have to step into. He says, the Egyptians you see today, you will see no more. He spoke out deliverance from their enemies and victory over the Egyptians before it even happened. Because Moses saw across the sea to the promised land that God had given. And here we are in a culture where we have our own form of Egyptians. And maybe it's somebody that says you can't do this. Maybe it's something that feels like it's going to keep you captive. Maybe something that's going to keep you locked up. And we have to have the bravery of Moses to say, no, no, no. My God is bigger than that. And He is going to deliver us. And here's what's so crazy in that story. At that moment, the Gospel says... The angel of God, who was going ahead of God's people, came behind the host of Israel. At that moment, the angel of God that was leading God's people came behind them. I was reading that, and I said, God, what are you kind of doing in this? What do you teach me? What what do you want me to see here, you know? And God, God gave me this. He said, the abundance of God will follow your persistence. If you are courageously patient enough, by faith, uncompromisingly to go, the abundance of God will come behind you and He will do it. And that's what I want you guys to see is the beautiful part of this. God is working in this organization and He's working in this city to do a work that is bigger than we could imagine. And I just want to encourage you guys to be brave, to keep going, to be bold enough to have the conversations to point back to Him and say, He's doing this. And to be humble enough to go to Him and let Him lead. Because Moses did not part the Red Sea. It was not his ambition that did it. It was God's goodness. So guys, be brave. Keep going with this work. and See what doors God might open. 
And I promise you it'll be a legacy that generations will speak of if we're willing to step into it and keep going. I, I wanted to introduce you guys to our guest today, and that is Dr. Tom Morris. Uh, I had the privilege of, of getting to know Tom through his daughter, Sarah. We were in um, kind of a, uh, a youth group together, and, and Tom was at the church I was attending at the time. Uh, Tom Morris uh, was Notre Dame's premier uh, professor. He was a, a, a philosophy professor at Notre Dame. He's a Moorhead scholar, uh, went to Yale. Like the list is like boom um, of all the stuff that Dr. Morris has accomplished. And yet he was at Notre Dame and, and felt this call uh, to leave, to begin speaking and taking philosophy into the public space. And so I want to invite my good friend, um, Dr. Tom Morris, uh, to, to join us now. Hey, brother. Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll grab a seat and just have a, a little combo here, Tom. All right. So, Tom, as I, as I kind of uh, said, I introduced this idea. You, you're a philosophy professor at Notre Dame. Fill in some of those gaps for folks. To... You guys, my life has been a series of leaps of faith that I never saw coming. I mean, even being a philosopher to start with, um, I got to tell you, Forbes, Fortune, Fast Company has never run an article, hot job of the year, philosopher. It's <laughs> never happened. It's never going to happen. And my first encounter with philosophy, nobody in my family had ever been to college. On both sides of my family, nobody had ever been. We had NASCAR mechanics. We had truck drivers. We had farmers. We had no college people. And I got this letter in the mail. You've been nominated for a Moorhead scholarship. At the time, Moorhead came now. I thought, what's this? You know, well, it turns out it's something really good. And uh, so I go to Carolina, and I'm going to be a business major because that's the way you can, you know, make some money or something. And uh, I have a philosophy class with one of these professors that if you say good morning, he'd work hard to prove you wrong, <laughs> right? And 15 minutes later, you're thinking maybe I was wrong. I mean, uh, and philosophy is not the kind of thing that you th normally think of, right? So the very fact that I became a philosopher in itself was kind of a leap of faith. I felt like I was supposed to. And so it doesn't make any sense, but I'm going to still do it because I feel like I'm supposed to. And then I go to Notre Dame. I, I, I did philosophy and religion. I did two degrees at, uh, at Yale, two PhDs of philosophy and religious studies. I went to Notre Dame to teach philosophy and religion. That was my academic specialty. And I was writing in journals all over the world and books with Oxford and Cornell and all these university presses. And I was blessed to do the pioneering work of bringing modern analytical logic, modern analytical philosophy to bear on distinctively Christian doctrines like the doctrine of the incarnation, the trinity, things like that. So uh, I, I was able to kind of spearhead this work in the, in the 20th century, which was something I didn't know I was gonna be doing and it was awesome, it was just so much fun. And so there I was at Notre Dame. I, I had an eighth of the student body in my classes most years and we were having so much fun. I mean, my kids, their birthday parties, the Notre Dame football team would come to my kids' birthday parties. I mean, for the, my kids to have an experience like this, it was like a place you would never want to leave. And then all of a sudden I left. I was the first full professor ever to just quit, not to go to another university, but just to go do something really different. And it was like, what are you having like the ultimate midlife crisis here? You know, just get a convertible. You don't have to quit your job. <laughs> and it was like, no, I really feel a sense of calling. I really feel a sense that I'm supposed to go do something else. And I even wrote an article in the Notre Dame Observer, the student newspaper saying, I'm not leaving you guys because I felt I found something more important than you. I'm leaving you guys because you prepared me to do something that nobody's done since Ralph Waldo Emerson 150 years ago, be a public philosopher. Thank you guys for helping me get ready to be able to do something like this. And so I didn't know. People said, you're giving up 20 years of guaranteed income. What are, you, what are you thinking? Businesses, how do you know that six months from now, business groups are going to want you to come and give a talk on philosophy? Really? And I didn't. But I knew it was something I was supposed to try. One of the most wonderful things in the Old Testament is the phrase, here I am, send me. Here I am, send me. OK. I mean, I was, my first business talk was to the Chamber of Commerce at South Bend. They called me and said, hey, we want you to give a talk on the ethics. I didn't teach on that at Notre Dame, but I said, okay. And then now, thousands of talks to business groups later, that's what got it all started. I didn't say, well, I, I don't really teach on ethics. It's like recently, I just I told me I just finished a book on, writing a book on Steve Jobs, a topic I never thought I'd write about. It'll be my 24th book or something. And I'd given a talk, a talk, three talks to this big international testing company, Prometric. If you have to be recertified in the industry, they're the guys who test you. 
And I'd given a talk on true success. You guys have the card. I'd given a talk on uh, if Aristotle ran General Motors, one of my books. Uh, you guys have the card, uh, the, the orange card there. I'd given a talk on how to deal with difficult change in our lives. And this guy calls me and says, hey, um, we're reading this uh, biography of Steve Jobs, who was like the world's biggest jerk, but he built the wor world's most valuable company. How does this work? And, and I did, I've learned in my life not to say, well, I, don't, I know nothing about Steve Jobs. Could you come and give a talk on Steve Jobs? And I didn't say, well, I'm, I don't know anything about Steve Jobs. I said, well, let me look into it. Let me look into it. Those have become the magic words in my life. Let me look into it, right? Now, when the people call me to talk on ethics, fortunately, I didn't say, well, I know nothing about ethics. I said, I don't teach on ethics at Notre Dame. Let me look into it. My whole life has been a series of things coming my way that I didn't expect, like the radio show for guys who's never been on radio. I, I got a call one day at Notre Dame. Could you be the national spokesman for Winnie the Pooh on Disney home videos? And it's like, wait, what? You know, it's not like you get your PhD in philosophy, you teach at a place like Notre Dame, then you're the national spokesman for Winnie the Pooh. I mean, it's not a normal career path, right? And so I was the national spokesman for Winnie the Pooh for two years. And um, that opened so many doors because there I was on network TV doing TV commercials for Winnie the Pooh, and it opened doors in ways I had never even guessed. I just said yes because it sounded like a, a crazy thing to do. I had no idea it was gonna pave the way for the future impact I could have as a Christian philosopher. There's this book with a title, Just Enough Light for the Step I'm On. I love that title, Just Enough Light for the Step I'm On. Guys, the most important things in your life, you never have any guarantees at all. You just say, here I am, send me. Okay, I feel a sense of calling, I feel a sense of mission, I feel like I'm being put, something comes across my path like this radio show. And he didn't know what the radio show would lead to. I didn't know what Winnie the Pooh would lead to. But you say, okay, let's give this a shot. And all the people worried about me leaving Notre Dame, You've given up 20 years of guaranteed income. Listen, I'm a Christian philosopher, and I've learned at this point in my life not to worry about stuff. But I hadn't learned that then. And so I had two or three sleepless nights. 20 years of guaranteed income. I have decided to give up here. I don't know if people will pay me six months. My third year in Wilmington, my income that year was more than 20 times my Notre Dame full professor salary. So it's like God saying, you did the right thing. You didn't have to give up anything. Hmm. Isn't that incredible? Yeah. But Patience, persistence. Wasn't my first year in Wilmington. It's my third year in Wilmington. Right. Well, Tom, one of the things that uh, really you know kind of rings home with me, and guys, just so you know the background here, um, in 2000, what was it, 13? Um, I kind of started feeling this Notre Dame moment for myself, you know, and and I reached out to Tom and I said, Tom. I don't know what it is, man, but I've got this kind of thing, right? That that I feel like God's calling me to speak, you know. And Tom says, "Great, let's get lunch tomorrow." And I was like, "What? Like you're traveling all over the world speaking to all these corporations? Like I'm in town. It's great, you know. We'll get lunch." And so we went to Brasserie. Yep. Um, so so talk to this idea of encouragement uh, for people um, kind of along that path, because I think a lot of times we walk this road of faith, and and we get to this moment of like, God, I'm not really sure. I don't know, yeah. and, and that's where we can have a profound role in, in encouragement that comes alongside that patience idea. I just knew I was supposed to encourage him. I didn't know why, and I'd never seen him write anything, so I didn't know he'd be a good writer, but I encouraged him to write this book that, that he did, which is a really good book, but I didn't know. You know, I, I, it's not like I had this history of knowing Matt Ham is gonna be a really good writer and encourage this guy. I just felt called to encourage him. Again, the sense of calling, the sense of what you're, you're supposed to do, and amazing, then this great book comes into existence. Be encouragers for other people. Wait a minute, this goes two ways. Um, seven years ago, I decided I gotta get in better shape. I was 58 years old, uh, a lot of old guys around Wilmington in my neighborhood, barely walking, you know, at the age of 80 and stuff, and I don't wanna be like, I better get in good shape. This is like my last chance to get in good shape. So I started going to the gym. I'd always gone to a gym for 15 minutes at a time. Okay, done, you know, and then go <laughs> home. Uh, 20 minutes maybe. I started going to the gym uh, seven years ago in August, two hours a day, seven days a week. And I tried all these exercises I'd never done before. And I tried to really go hard. And a guy comes up to me one day and says, you're making more noise than anybody else in this gym. <laughs> and I said, well, you should hear me get up, in the, get up in the morning and walk to the bathroom. I mean, my whole body was achy and, you know, but he said, you're the only guy in this gym really trying. I want to be your workout partner. This guy has been my workout partner for seven years. 
and he's much younger than I am, lifetime surfboarder, skateboarder, a surfer, skateboarder, weightlifter. He's in the most encouraged, he has the gift of encouragement. He's the most encouraging person I have ever known. His name is Don. And Don saw me, I had never done bench press before, guys. Uh, you know, bench press. You're, uh, uh, we have a Smith machine. It runs in these uh, rails, you know. You do. I saw a guy about my age doing 85 pounds. So I try 85 pounds. Okay, I can do this. Go in the next day, do it again. Next day, do it again. You're not supposed to do this every day. I didn't know. Then Don, I meet Don. And he says, come on, I think you can do a little bit more than that. You've got to make some days, uh, two or three days, where you can do more than that. And so I did uh, 100 pounds. And he, yeah, I think you're looking strong today. I think you do a little more. A little more, 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 more. By the time I turned 60, I was benching 315 pounds. If you had asked me when I was first starting, will you ever bench 300 pounds? I would have said, are you crazy? But I had this encouraging guy in my life who didn't see limits, who saw possibilities. We all need Dons in our lives, but the deeper truth is we need to be Dons for other people in our lives. Give that encouragement. Give that, you know, I didn't say, well, Matt, first send me 100 writing samples. Let me see if I can encourage you in what you're doing. I mean, it's a funny thing how God works in the world. He feels inspired to speak and write, and I feel inspired to encourage him to speak and write. Great combination. Don uh, Sharp didn't know I was going to, you know, be some great weightlifter. He just knew I was trying to get in better shape. Uh, so respond to that little voice. Respond to that little spark. Encourage others, and when you're on your right path, making your own little leaps, whatever that means in your life, you're gonna attract the encouragers that are meant for you. It's an amazing thing how that yeah. works. Yeah, you know, you just said that. It reminded me of your friend Don, um, the, the, the story of the, the rock musician. Guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so let's talk about this because, um, you know, there's these seeds, right, that we have planted in us, and we know this is something that's burning inside. And, and there's something profound and powerful yeah. about seeing it before it happens. Yeah. Tell about your friend, Don. Well, I've got this friend from junior high school. He's my best friend. And he was, I was a musician. I played in rock bands and soul bands before I became a philosopher. I traveled and everything. And um, I made some good money doing that. And, and I had a friend in junior high who was my best friend who was a, he thought he was a musician. He was a tambourine player. He was the world's <laughs> worst tambourine player. He like had no rhythm. And he was, the, he was a singer who is worse than any singer I've ever seen on the early American Idol auditions. I mean, this guy was awful. He got kicked out of a Baptist church choir. The minister said, please serve God some other way. I mean, this is, this is how good at music he was. But he'd come to my house every day after school. I grew up in Durham. He'd come to my house, come on, let's, let's start a band. Do you want to start a band? Let's start a band. I said, just, let's just talk about that later. You know, we, I'd plug in my guitar. He'd shake his tambourine. My parents would get out of the house. Make a long story short, he felt a calling to go be a great musician. And the rest of us were like, this is idiocy. Talk about foolishness in the eyes of the world. It's like, it's like the worst thing he could ever think. He, he, got, he was at Duke as a sophomore, and he says, you know, I can't be a great musician in Durham. I gotta leave here. He quit Duke, uh, which as a Tar Heel, I recommend anybody that you know that's a, but uh, uh, he, um, I'm gonna go to the music, music center, New York, LA, they're too far. I know, I'll go to Nashville. So he goes to Nashville. And he starts doing these little things, little things. Big goals ultimately break down to the little things you do right day to day. He learns how to play guitar. He takes voice lessons. He hangs out in good clubs where the great musicians were hanging out. Last time I talked to him about this, he has written a number one hit song 24 times. So he's had 24 number one hit songs. He's had 55 top five hit songs. His first uh, hit song was uh, The Gambler for Kenny Rogers and Forever and Ever Amen. And he's written for every famous person in country music you've ever heard of. He's wrote, he wrote their, a lot of their hit songs. He's made so many tens of millions of dollars. He can't, he's lost count. And I'm determined the next time I see him, I'm, I've got a question as a philosopher I want to ask him. Does he want to start a band? <laughs> I mean, this is the kind of, you know, he was always asking me to start a band with him. And I was thinking, no, the guy is it's hopeless. You know, uh, but he had this inner thing, the seed, that only he could see. But it turned into this amazing life. Um, don't hold yourself back. One of the things I've learned, and, and probably my biggest adventure, leaving Notre Dame was big, but I've done something for the last six years that in a sense is even crazier. I've been writing novels, something I never thought I could do. Uh, but a, a movie came, started playing in my head six years ago 
of a little boy and his uncle crossing the desert in Egypt in 1934, and they're having this conversation in an oasis, and it's really good. So I run upstairs and start typing as fast as I can. Well, it turned into eight novels of over a million words. They're starting to come out now. They're my Harry Potter, my Indiana Jones, my uh, Lord of the Rings, my Narnia tales. It, 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 it's the crazy. My wife said, how do, you, how do you know that anybody's ever going to pay you a penny to write novels? I said, I don't. I just, know, uh, I just know I'm supposed to do it. So I've been doing, and now if you look at Amazon, I brought the first book to, uh, and the second book today, The Oasis Within and, and The Golden Palace. If you look on Amazon, uh, The Oasis Within, uh, I think now uh, it has more five-star reviews than any book uh, I, I've ever done. It's the greatest blessing in my life of any book I've ever done. It was my 20th book, and it's something I never saw coming. It's something that, like Winnie the Pooh, fell into my lap. It's something I just had to say yes to. You have to be a person. Your faith really manifests itself in your being able to do something that you feel pushed to do, whether it seems to make any sense or not. So, so as a philosopher, the study of logic and yeah. reason, you know, uh, one of the things that, uh, you know, Kevin and I talk about is that faith by definition is not logical. So how do you relegate that, you know, kind of in a logical one plus one equals two world where God multiplies food? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what does that look like kind of in today's culture, you know, for us and, and kind of the corporate space and how do we start to kind of navigate that? Well, my whole academic career was built on looking at Christian doctrines like the, the incarnation. Jesus was both human and divine, right? How is this possible? So I looked at every objection that had ever been raised throughout history against the doctrine of the incarnation. It's illogical, it's irrational, it's absurd, it's impossible. And I showed what the answer was to each and every objection. And so a university press that had never published a Christian book, Cornell University Press, they said, this is good stuff, and put out the book, The Logic of God Incarnate. There is this weird blend of logic and craziness in our lives as, as Christians. You examine the doctrines of the faith and every objection can be answered, not just with some kind of lame answer, but with an answer that strikes you as much more convincing than the objection. However, however formidable the objection might have looked, the deeper you look into it. Francis Bacon, uh, a philosopher of a former century, said an interesting thing. A little philosophy inclines men's minds to atheism. More philosophy solves the problem. It's easy, problems are easy. Solutions you have to, to look for. Uh, the Christian life, in fact, you see Matt talk about the Christian life. You never sit there and say to yourself, if this guy could just be a little more enthusiastic about this stuff, you know? I mean, I, I did my Steve Jobs book, which hasn't come out yet, but I just finished my editing. And a famous businessman from India read it in draft and a global business guy. And he said, the thing that impresses me about Steve Jobs, he has huge passion and he found a problem equal to that passion to solve. Hmm. He said, we should all be that way. Have a huge passion, and is a passion a rational thing? Did, my friend Don, his passion for music was not a rational thing, but he had a huge passion. And he found a problem equal to that, to, to that passion. I'm going to be a great musician. That was, that was a problem to solve, right? Because it didn't look like that was in the cards at all. You know, Steve Jobs, we're going to change the world. We're going to make a dent in the universe. We're going to, he had so many different ways of saying it. But that was a huge problem. It, it was like problems, whoa, by definition, something to avoid. No, find the right problems to solve in your life hmm. that are equal to your passion, that can spur the passion to another level. Because you ask people, tell me the thing that you remember about Steve the most. They would say, God, his passion. He was so passionate. I, I said to a guy who was his direct report for six years, I said, you know, did he ever enjoy himself or was he always working? He said, he loved work more than life itself. He had a passion for work. Now, have you given yourself a problem that's worth your passion? H have you taken on a challenge? What Matt's talking about, change the city, change the world, right? Uh, using your faith in your job, but you're using your faith in other ways too. Uh, sometimes you can leverage off your job to do things that nobody in your job has ever done. But you as a creative person 
you're going you're gonna to bring this to bear in a, in a new way. Um, that's what faith is all about, and that's what the logic of faith is all about. There's this kind of internal logic to faith that's different from what you learn in your symbolic logic courses. There's this internal developing, here I am, send me, taking what Kierkegaard called the leap of faith, which was not a leap against all evidence, but it was a leap towards something that a lot of people around you who are not feeling the same call are going to be saying, really? You know, are you sure about this? I'm not sure you're doing the right... You know, you've got to listen to people, right? Book of Proverbs, wise advisors. you got to surround yourself with wise advisors. But sometimes you just have to do what you know you're called to do, regardless of whether anybody else sees it or not. Yeah. Don, one of the things that's, uh, that's kind of interesting to bring up, I think a lot of times kind of in, oh, by the way, I, I have to look, look at the socks, man. I mean, yeah, like, yeah, you know, we did not plan this. Is, yeah, no, we did not plan this. <laughs> Great, crazy socks, people. Oh, that's good. So, so these are actually my subdued socks. There you go. Okay. <laughs> the 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 concept I think that we fall into the trap of believing in kind of business life is that faith has no place. Oh. Um, we 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 get into this mindset that says, oh well, the separation of church and state, and oh the all, all of the reasons why not, um, and we start to kind of segregate our lives and live a life as if faith exists on Sunday or at my private home. But then when I come in on Monday, I have to live by a different set of rules, you know? And so we live this compartmentalized, exhaustive life um, that becomes very problematic without us even knowing it. Um, so how, how do we begin to cultivate faith as this underlying or scarlet thread through life? Um, and, and what application does it have in that space? And see, we're not the first to face this. I brought another book today for anybody who, who wants one. Um, the National Endowment for the Humanities asked me to direct seminars for eight years, eight summers for school teachers, all the best school teachers in, in the U.S. Uh, they would come and live with me for a month, and we would go through a 17th century French thinker, Blaise Pascal. Uh, uh, it was called pa uh, Pascal's Pensées, Faith, Reason, and the Meaning of Life, and I wrote the seminar up as a book which is called uh, Making Sense of It All, uh, Pascal and the Meaning of Life. But Pascal said, life every day, every hour, every minute of every day, has three la layers or levels or dimensions. There's the physical, our bodies. There's the intellectual, our minds. And there's the spiritual, he said, the highest of all. And he would talk about our hearts using the ancient metaphor that brings together all of the best of us, united and even beyond. Pascal says you are not flourishing as a human being unless you are flourishing on all three levels at every hour of every day. So you gotta be bringing your spiritual best, your intellectual best, your physical best to every situation you're in. He said one of the greatest, and, and see, I, I put together my book out of, he, he was converted, he was raised a nominal Catholic but didn't really believe anything, and so he kind of left his faith behind. Then he had a mystical experience one night. He called it the night of fire. Hmm. He, he was one of the founding modern scientists, so he took notes on his mystical experience. I mean, really, you know, <laughs> he took notes and he sewed it in his coat next to his heart so that he would never be apart from his memorial, he called it, to his night of fire. And uh, Pascal decided to try to convince all his atheist friends of the truth of Christianity, he started taking notes, and he died before he could write the book, at the age of 39. Uh, and we have his notes, called the Pensees, the Thoughts. And so I went through his notes every eight years, teaching to these school teachers, and trying to figure out, okay, what's going on here, what's going on here, what's going on here? The three levels, he has this one little note that says, pious scholars rare pious scholars, rare. So, okay, what's this mean? You know, you go into a university, you go through survey the faculty at a big school, especially, you might not find a lot of pious people. You'll find a lot of secular people. Pious scholars, rare, what? Oh, wait a minute. If you're really good on one of the three levels, if you're really good on the intellectual level, you get all your praise from the intellectual level. You get all your affirmation. You get all your success from your mind. Pretty soon, the other two levels are going to atrophy. You're not even going to think about the spiritual. You don't even think about the physical. Have you ever seen math professors try to find their cars in the parking lot at the end of the school day? It's like, these guys, it's like, where's my car? I don't remember where. I mean, their physical world, forget about it. Um, intellectual athletes rare. 
When I was at Notre Dame, I taught all the football players. They started off failing my class of, okay, what were the numbers? Of 50, 55 varsity athletes in Philosophy 101, the first year I won a big teaching award and they got all, all the varsity athletes were put in my class. The 55 varsity athletes, uh, I think it was, I had 29 of the 31 freshman football players. 26 failed my first exam with scores I had never personally witnessed in all my years of teaching. <laughs> Total exam scores out of 100 points of 1, 7, 13, 19. What? What? One guy worked for an hour and made a zero. I had never seen this before. They were just as smart as the other kids. By the end of the semester, they were doing great work. But they had become so focused on the physical because they were, you know, Hall of Fame, you know, they're at Muller High School in Ohio, they were top football, all state, all this. They, they lost track often of the spiritual and the, and the intellectual. I had to revive, I had to t show them that, you know what, you, you, you're smart, you're teachable, you're uh, self-disciplined, you're persistent, you can use these uh, 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 qualities from the football field, you can transfer them into the philosophy classroom. They, they ended up doing great. Um, we're supposed to flourish on all three levels here at the bank in everything we, we do. Hmm, Believe it or not, that's my short answer. No, nah, that's, that's good. Well, Tom, I mean, I, you know, this is a treat for me and, and certainly for everybody here. We could sit here and probably just carry on all day. I know yeah, we'd, 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 we'd love to. We just keep going. Um, so, so kind of in, 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 in closing up with this, this idea is what, what's kind of a charge, I, I guess, for the, the person that's sitting out there and saying, okay, well, man, this all sounds great about a call. This all sounds great about for you. Um, you know, how do I start to kind of discover that and, 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 and how do I begin to kind of step in, right? I think one of the things yeah. that, uh, the number one thing I believe that God asks for from us is a humble, willing heart. A humble, willing heart to be able to go where he leads um, and, and then the courageous patience to follow that out, right? So, so for, for those that are, that are here, you know, what, what are your kind of parting thoughts on uh, maybe cultivating that and, and then taking that step once we leave the room? You know, it, it's like I've been asked a few times. I can't remember where, but I've been on, you know, a ton of TV shows, which is always a scary experience. We go be like Regis and Kathy Lee when it was at its height of popularity. That's when I launched my first book. And, and I got to be on Today's Show with Matt Lauer for nine minutes one day. And you think it's like if you think nine minutes is not long, try to be on national TV and not say something stupid for nine consecutive <laughs> minutes. It's unbelievable. But I've had the chance to be on NPR and all these other things, radio and, and TV things. So I can't remember who first asked me this. But somebody asked me along the way, okay, if you had to sum up the most important thing you've ever learned as a philosopher, what would it be? And I just kind of spontaneously said, life is supposed to be a series of adventures. The one you're on now is setting you up for the next one in ways you probably can't even imagine. But we should live life as a series of adventures. Whether that means having a series of jobs or whether that means having a series of adventures within a job. Because the inner is always more important than the outer in life. So if you're not having inner adventures, nothing's going to feel satisfying. I know a guy right now who's going through a lot of inner troubles, and he's trying to save it, uh, solve it by making outer changes. Never works. Never works. Hmm. Uh, the, new, the problems would just follow you to wherever you go, right? But from a Christian point of view, uh, we're, I think we're here to have a series of adventures. And it's that openness. I talked to a psychologist once who said to me, I think the single greatest human quality is openness. Openness to the new, openness to a new adventure. Have, have any of you ever gone to, would you raise your hand if you've ever gone to Whole Foods here in town at all, if you've ever used Whole Foods? Um, I got an email one day from a guy saying, I love all your books. Your business books have changed my life. If you're ever in Austin, Texas, I want to take you out to dinner. And I was going to be in Austin, Texas in a month. And I'm thinking, free dinner. This is great. I didn't even just look at who it was. I don't care. Free dinner is a free dinner. So I write him back and say, I'm going to be in Austin March 23rd, 24th. Oh, I mean, he writes me back right away. I'm in Dallas those two days. If you could come a day early, you could stay at my house and I'll cook you dinner. Okay, this is taking a turn I didn't expect. And so, <laughs> so I look down to the end of the email, who is this guy? Uh, John Mackey, founder and CEO of Whole Foods. And so I just said, 
I'm going a day early and staying at his house just to see what's in his refrigerator.